other folks. So some comments and observations about chapter 15, which you'll recall deals with the ethics of business and media. Now, gosh, I don't know why our authors do this, but they will often make direct references to important concepts without giving the standard name for that concept. Or sometimes they uh, try to coin their own phrase for something that uh, there's a standard expression that already exists. So I think that I'm gonna have to be focusing on that for the um, business ethics part of this chapter. I don't think I have anything much to say about the media ethics part. I think they did pretty well. Although always when you read something that's meant to be scholarly, look for the footnotes. If you find that you're having sentence after sentence, paragraph after, after paragraph with no sources cited to support your points, well, that's not really good scholarship. And I think our authors for a follow of that. So let me just share some comments and observations about chapter 15, specifically the part about business ethics. So turning then to my PowerPoint. Ah, here we go. Now, the uh, authors make reference on page 322 and 324 to the notion that the only responsibility of business is to maximize profits. Uh, we also have one of the reading assignments today is a famous or indeed infamous essay by Milton Friedman. Well, this concept that the central purpose of a corporation is to maximize profit uh, is what's known as shareholder capitalism. Uh, now on page 323, we do have a reference to uh, corporations' responsibilities when it comes to employers, employees, shareholders, businesses, and consumers. This seems to be a rough approximation of a different concept called stakeholder capitalism. Uh, now, for most of the 20th century, um, here in the United States, stakeholder capitalism was the default. Yes, um, the cardinal, although turning a profit was a concern, it had to be balanced again and sometimes so subordinate to see into the well being of managers and employees. So, for example, safe and humane working conditions and treatment, consumers ensuring that the goods sold did what they were sent to do, society in general, you don't want to poison the environment for, and so on. And then after all those other considerations, then shareholder profit uh, was one consideration. Whereas in sh pure shareholder capitalism, the carnal emphasis is upon turning a profit and everything else is subordinated to that. Now, our authors seem to also talk around three different major concepts when it comes to economics. And I need to add here, I do not have a graduate degree in economics, but, I, but what I'm sharing with you all are fairly common concepts uh, when economics is discussed by pundits in the news. So um, on page 322 through 325, they <coughs> allude to three different theories of economics without naming them directly. Now, the first one of these is what's called classical or laissez-faire economics. And this was based on the works of Adam Smith in specifically his book, The Wealth of Nations. Now, Smith thought that the economy was overall self-regulating. He talked about the invisible hand of the marketplace. And he argued that government intervention was neither useful nor called for. In fact, he thought that government intervention would get in the way of maximizing prosperity for the vast majority of people. Now, Calvin Coolidge uh, apparently uh, back in the 1920s apparently was informed by the views of classical economics 
he famously stated that uh, the business of America is business. Uh, however, his successor was Herbert Hoover. And when Herbert Hoover was confronted with the um, challenge of the Great Depression, he just did not have, since he was working from this framework of classical economics, he did not have the intellectual tools to deal with it. So, if classical economics can be traced to the events that led to the Great Depression, as some people argue, because with uh, little regulation, you had a tendency towards a monopoly, and you tended to have uh, a shallow hollowing out of the middle class. So you had relatively few monopolists who were very, very wealthy during what's called the Gilded Age, but you had uh, even more people that were have-nots who were just struggling to survive. So the Great Depression hits, and how can we understand why it takes so long to recover? Well, a following went by the name of John Maynard Keynes, articulated the concept of demand-side economics. He observed the reason the economy did not promptly adapt and spring back from the Great Depression was because of weak demand. And he suggested the government should um, prime the pump, so to speak, uh, by funding infrastructure projects such as the WPA, the CCC, and the TVA, um, even if this called for deficit spending to get money into the hands of consumers. It was thought that if you increase the demand, people want, you know, once people who've been struggling and just scarcely getting by have a bit of money in their pocket, they're gonna spend it. And that stokes demand and that stokes business. Um, now that uh, demand side uh, kind of policy was the default up until about the 1980s. In the 1980s, we have this other theory that became popular under Reagan, and it's been our default here in the U.S. ever since. Uh, now, and that's called supply-side economics. Now, unlike classical economics and like Keynesian economics, supply-side holds that the government has a right to intervene in the economy. However, unlike Keynesianism, Supply side focuses on giving tax breaks and incentives to wealthy individuals on the theory that this will prompt them to create new businesses that will in turn create jobs and thus boost the economy. For this reason, it's sometimes called trickle down economics. Now, on page 324 through 326, we find again our authors trying to coin new expressions for things that are already pretty well established. They talk about the competitive approach, the government control approach, and the moderate possession when it comes to economic policy. Well, what they describe as the competitive approach seems to map pretty closely on classical or laissez-faire economics, that government should stand on the way of business and that people compete and the cream will re rise to the top. Um, now, they also describe what they call the government control approach. And I'm not sure which of these two, two, two different concepts they were referring to. On the one hand, uh, we find that in classical socialism, uh, workers were thought meant to control the means of production. And it was thought that this would lead to greater prosperity for everyone. Uh, the theory of communism, as I understand it, um, uh, it, it, Marx's studies is a whole field unto itself, but as I understand it, it calls for a planned political economy in which government controls all the major businesses. So what's described under the heading of the moderate position seems to map onto a system that's called social democracy, in which private enterprise still exists but union membership for workers is supported. Government regulation stems the worst of corporate abuses and a generous social safety net sees to the welfare of people and supports those who are for whatever reason incapable of competing in the marketplace. Uh, this incidentally is the default model today uh, in Northern and Western Europe. 
Now, as with our author's coinage of domino argument for a slippery slope argument, and their coinage of mercy death and mercy killing in place of existent suicide and euthanasia, I think they have similarly talked themselves around the terms and the concepts that I've just shared with you. Um, I don't know why they felt obliged to come up with the, these new coinages when there's uh, expressions that already exist for these ideas. Um, so I thought the foregoing was necessary to give you some additional clarity. Uh, I think most of the rest of the material in this chapter is pretty straightforward, but feel free to contact me via email if you want anything that in the text elaborated or clarified. Incidentally, when you're answering questions, you need to refer to the assigned reading assignments and you need to give me a page number. If all you give me is a year, unless it's a link to a web page, uh, we academics, it's publish or perish folks. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to publish all kinds of things in a year. So if all I get is the year, I have no way of knowing what passage you're alluding to. Well, I think I've uh, hit my two page limits and I think I may have gone over my 15, page, 15 minute limits when it comes to recording. So I'm going to stop now. I will record a, a, the announcement for the next and the last reading assignment from the textbook momentarily. Stop.